Hi guys. It is a lovely May Day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is a soon to be snowy May Day. It is 43 degrees here on Monday, May 1st. We've already had a sleet shower. Snow on the way. And uh, are we going to be talking about global warming or not? Uh, so anyway, well, I have been having a frustrating day being an organic gardener. Uh, we won't go, we can find that rant elsewhere. Uh, but we're going to go over and take a wild guess where for our medium.com dose of doom for the week. This fellow, I think I've mentioned this fellow before, Martin Edick, E-D-I-C, with his uh, Chronicle of the Collapse titled, Earth Will Be Fine, Humanity Not So Much. And before I even, before I even go uh, in there, uh, I, I want to, uh, I want to blame George Carlin, one of my heroes, for being one of, uh, for probably as much as any human being on this planet, uh, this clueless moron uh, comment about the planet will be fine. The, so, whenever a doomer is talking about saving the planet, the, these clueless morons uh, act like that these doomers are suggesting that humans are d literally destroying the big ball of rock. Uh, I, I have, you know, I saw this crap uh, on my soft white underbelly interview. Hundreds of comments. The Earth will be just fine. Humans aren't gonna mess up the Earth. Get pull it, just shut up. You know goddamn well what we're talking about when we say save the planet, and it ain't talking about saving us humans. The way to save this planet is to get every goddamn human off of it. We're talking about saving uh, every bit of life on this planet that is managing to survive humanity. Cut this crap uh, about the earth will be fine. I, I just get so sick and tired of it. And, 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 I, and I can't even believe that I clicked on this essay w w with this clueless moron title that Martin Edick should be embarrassed about. But anyway, once you get past the title, it's pretty good. Yes? So, uh, take it away, Martin Edick. I've been observing and writing about climate change for over 20 years, and there are a few takeaways as we find ourselves in the thick of it. We are not destroying the planet. We are destroying our ability to live on the planet, and we are taking a lot of species down with us, as many as half of them. I would say as many as every species on the planet, with the possible exception of jellyfish. I don't know why Martin Edick thinks that humans are, 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 are going to stop at taking down half of the species with us. We talk about things like biodiversity, feedback loops, and complex systems, and our situation now is right in the thick of it. Whether we survive or not, we, many humans, are setting biological evolution back millions of years through mass extinctions. Those lost species represent the culmination of the almost incomprehensible interconnectivity of everything. Buddhism and science are in confluence about many things. This is driven by their exploration of our relationship with the world and the understanding that everything is dependent on everything else. That connection brings us to chaos theory, 
that cliche that the flapping of a butterfly's wings in China might change the weather in the U.S. You might say that everything is constantly changing all the time as we alter basic elements of the system. That is normal, but the scale of our destructive actions is almost beyond comprehension. We surpassed a global population of 8 billion humans this past year. So anyway, guys, I have actually uh, was, was going to do, uh, Sandy and I were talking about doing this very rant. I was having this conversation with a, uh, with a, a, a Doomer Chick friend of mine uh, just the past couple of weeks and we were talking about what you hear from these climate deniers about how the sun, the sun is what is affecting uh, you know global climate change. It has nothing to do with humans. That the climate has been changing uh, for, for, well, for billions of years. And uh, so she was wondering about my, uh, and, you know, how I understand this and what do I say to people when, it, whether it's the sun, whether it's the tilt of the earth, whether it's what's called the procession, all of these natural uh, geological and astronomical cycles that have been going on for millions and billions of years before humans ever got here that the climate uh, has been changing uh, over and over that we've gone ice age, you know, ice age, hothouse, back and forth before humans ever got here. So this is evidence that humans have nothing to do with this. And as I was explaining to her, and this is just basically intuition on my time. If anybody has ever, probably the Buddhists talk about the wheel inside the wheel. We have all of these wheels going on at the same time. Big, slow wheels. It's called the wheel inside the wheel. And so you can go back hell. You can go all the way back, I guess, to continental drift uh, is, is the reason that you find uh, remnants of rainforest in Antarctica. So you, 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 can, you can sit here and point out all of these wheels that if humans uh, were nowhere in the thing, yes, you would have all of these wheels uh, inter, you know, affecting this planet and more importantly, life on it. But the fundamental change that has happened here is the human wheel inside the wheel that we humans are, are spinning our little wheel so far, uh, it, it is getting so fast and out of control, our little wheel, that it, 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 all of these other natural processes, which are still happening in the background, I don't think you're going to find any uh, climatologists or evolutionary biologists uh, to deny that natural processes do affect this planet over large scales of time that give life on Earth time to adjust to these glacially slow changes as all of the big wheels keep turning. It is the little wheel inside the big wheels meaning the human wheel has completely put all the other wheels in the background. Uh, and that is what the way I was trying to explain it, but it's basically the same thing that Martin E. Dick is trying to say here. I think that, meaning all of that stuff in the background, is normal. But the scale of our 
destructive actions is almost beyond comprehension. And I would not say it's almost beyond comprehension for doomers. We can barely comprehend it. But 99.9% .9 of this planet have zero comprehension of the scale of humanity's destructive action on this planet. Okay, so at the same time, all of this going on, at the same time, scientists estimate we need to produce 180% of the food and resources we currently have to support our population of 8 billion. We're not making it, and people are dying or losing their homes and livelihoods as a result. There are so many alarming indicators, it is almost impossible to grasp it as a whole system. This is why virtually nobody on the planet outside of a few doomers are looking at the whole system going down the toilet because of one reason or eight billion reasons and that is called humans. Kawana Scotsy, life out of balance. The climate movement doesn't need to prove it exist anymore. We are way past that reality. What we need to be doing is looking at how we will live in this changed environment. Because of the economics of power, politics, fossil fuels, and an insatiable need for more things, we are literally doing nothing, nothing in relation to the size of this challenge. The stat about food waste in the U.S. that we throw away 34% of our food is a staggering number in a world where many people are starving. Americans suffer <coughs> from two social diseases that keep us from taking collective action. We are too addicted to materialism and comfort, and we are incredibly selfish when those things are threatened. I've written recently about an example of that selfishness and denial in an article about the reality in Florida that they refuse to deal with. That's one tiny example, uh, you know, about how Florida was the biggest it was the fastest growing state in the country last year. More clueless morons were pouring into Florida the same year that Hurricane Ian was sweeping through than in any other state. Unbelievable. That is one tiny example of our failure to envision how human life works in this newly emerging world. If a homeowner loses their home due to an extreme weather event and wants to rebuild, this is exactly what my own brother in Fort Myers, Florida is doing right now. He is rebuilding, trying to rebuild his house after it was flattened, well at least flooded, uh, in Ian last year. He is so far, what is he up to, $70,000 he has spent to rebuild his house so it can get knocked down again in another hurricane. If a homeowner such as Sam's clueless moron brother loses their home due to an extreme weather event and wants to rebuild, that is just one more sign of our stubborn resistance to change. But there is something else. We personalize these disasters when we insist on ignoring reality when it hits us personally. 
That is a destructive social disease called denial. It is not a matter of needing more knowledge. It is a matter of not wanting to accept that knowledge. It's everywhere. Turn on PBS and they'll assault you with endless horrifying facts about climate change. I no longer believe it's the right approach. And understand, my brother has a master's degree in journalism. He is absolutely in denial that this could happen again. <clears throat> we need to be changing the way we think into a mindset that says the things we do for others are far more important and fulfilling than the things we do for ourselves. I am perfectly aware that this is inconceivable in a wealthy society like the one I live in. Too much of our self-esteem is measured in stuff, money, and comfort that says a 4,000 square foot house is twice as good as a 2,000 square foot house, even if only two people live in it. As in my brother's house, it is he and his wife are the only two people living in a probably a 3,000 square foot house. Where they're living while they're rebuilding it is their perfectly decent sized upstairs garage apartment. Uh, that that's where they're living that did not flood. They, they're in their late 70s and they, they have a perfectly decent, uh, probably 600 square foot, uh, very nice garage apartment. I've stayed in it. They're spending tens of thousands of dollars to rebuild the main house, which will just flood again. Think about this. Like a lot of our choices, it makes no sense whatsoever, but it is just one example of our societal selfishness. In the housing example above, the counterpart to that thinking is the burgeoning tiny house movement, huh? Especially among younger generations, it represents a craving for simplicity, simplicity that is easily within reach of many in the West. And uh, this is exactly, so I now have four houses and my camper, so I have five living units. I personally own five living units. You add all five of my housing units together, and I think it might equal the square footage of my brother's upstairs garage apartment. Three of us living there full time and room for uh, 10 more people. I could fit about uh, between 10 and 15 people could live in a space the size of my brother's uh, uh, upstairs uh, garage apartment. This is why I love tiny houses. It is simplicity that is easily within reach of many in the West, but we will not, the vast majority of people are not going to live in a tiny house. I could send this rant, and I, and, and I will send this rant, and he knows goddamn well who I'm sending out this rant to. Dude, I love you, brother, but listen to what this is saying. And stop uh, trying to live above your means. I love tiny houses. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, if we act on that craving, meaning that craving for simplicity, we are seen by society as failing at the so-called American dream, a dream that has brought us these nightmares down upon us. The answer to living with a changing climate is right in front of us, 
but we cannot imagine or see it. It's called reality, and we work very hard to fend it off. In spite, and this of course we have to get to the hopium, in spite of all this doom and gloom, I see movement towards simplicity and a less material world among generations who often grew up with abundance. In recent years, we have seen some leadership in government tell us to always take care of ourselves first. They use failed economic theories like trickle-down to have us believe we can buy our way into happiness and prosperity. But those ideas come from a generation that lived most of its life on a different planet. Younger generations have grown up knowing these changes are real and are developing a pent-up desire to do something, anything, I ha, I ha, I ha, I ha, I hope I'm right. Well, brother, I wish you were, but you're wrong. Anyway, I gotta wrap this up because I think it's starting to snow and uh, I have to go put chains on my tires so I can go get a drink. Bye, guys. Alright, the camera did not shut off, little dog.